I'm Jim Mundorf. This is Lonesome Lands Podcast, and you can watch the podcast on YouTube or listen on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This one is going to be all about government control of, or the government's push to control private lands, um, and their tool that they're trying to use um, to do that is is conservation easements. And where I first heard about these things was I've been learning about them for the last couple of years because when Joe Biden first got into office, he signed an executive order that has now been come to be known as the 30 by 30 plan. And what it said was that he wants um, to control 30% of the U.S.'s uh, lands and waters by the year 2030. Or he wants to conserve. He, he uses the word conserve. I feel like it's more of a control over those lands. Um, but when he signed that, you know, he signed a num a lot of different executive orders as soon as he got into office, and so that one kind of got lost in the shuffle. But the first person to find it and really report on it is Margaret Byfield, and we've had her on here before, and and you're going to hear from her today, and um, she's reported on this and and worked hard to to bring bring attention to it, and and she's talked about how the the tool for gaining this for gain for Accomplishing this goal is is conservation easements and and their push to get private property owners to sign up for them. Um, and then a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago now, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the NCBA, had on their podcast um, two guys that worked for land trust organizations and they were pushing conservation easements. I, I describe them as as salesmen of these conservation easement deals, and that kind of I found that pretty odd, but then a few weeks later, um, they they gave out their Environmental Stewardship Award, the NCBA did, and um, that award was sponsored by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service. So the NRCS was sponsors of the NCBA award, their Environmental Award. And those are the those are the organizations pushing these conservation easements, and so what I think people need to realize, and what's kind of been come become clear to me, is that the NCBA is really just a tool. Over these last couple of years, they they become just a tool of the federal government, and and their goal is to get um, their members, farmers and ranchers, to hand over their rights and to give up their rights to the federal government. And this has become clear, really clear through the electronic ID mandate, um, the TAG mandate. They received four hundred forty-five thousand dollars from the USDA, and and the goal, what they said that money was for, is to promote the idea of animal traceability. And what the electronic ID mandate is, USDA says it's all about, is animal traceability. So they received almost half a million dollars to promote this idea to their members. They became a tool of the USDA, the federal government, to promote that idea to their members. And during their last um, convention, their goal and their stated policy at the beginning of the convention was to have all cattle um, by a certain year, I think it was 2026, to have all cattle wearing electronic ID um, tags. And so... Because their members actually pushed back against that, um, the, no mandates were were part of their actual policy. But then, when the electronic ID mandate came out, they said, "Well, they didn't lobby for the mandate, but they lobbied to have taxpayers pay for all the tags that would be mandated." And so they still came out. You know, really, we lobbied for it without lobbying for it. And so, um, and then you have these uh, this climate smart agenda. Or the, or the sustainability agenda that NCBA has been pushing for years and, and these climate smart commodities, which the USDA wants to get all farmers and ranchers signed up on and their $3 billion plan. I've talked a lot about this in the past, but NCBA is a partner in that with Farm Journal and they're a partner in that $40 million grant that Farm Journal received um, to promote this to their members. Um, and now you have... You know, the, the NRCS sponsoring their awards, who knows how much money's changing hands in there, and they are coming out and promoting conservation easements. Um, and so that's something that their members really need to be aware of, that when they sign those checks, they write those checks and pay those dues and become members of this organization, they're really just signing up to be, come, you know, to, to get manipulated. Um, um, that's the NCBA's 
roles here is to manipulate their members, farmers and ranchers, and to gift them to give up their rights to the federal government. And I actually recorded this uh, interview with Margaret a couple weeks ago, and um, then I got stuck running a planner for a week, and then the EID mandate came out, so I wanted to have the Bill Bullard uh, podcast kind of push that in front of that this one. And in between time, uh, it's maybe a good thing that that uh, that I had to push it back because um, it's it's become apparent that the the federal government is really focused on this issue because um, President Biden's Twitter account and whoever is running that thing, which I, I doubt they're letting him anywhere near it, but um, they put out a tweet that says, um, under President Biden, it says, I committed to you that I'm going to conserve at least 30% of America's land and waters by 2030, period. And folks, were well on our way. And so that just goes to show kind of... Um, that the people pushing for this conservation uh, movement and, and these easements to get signed are are really just doing the work of of the administration. And I don't want to come off too judgmental or or like I'm looking down on on people in the podcast who have signed on these conservation easements. I've talked to good people who have who have signed on to sign these contracts, and a lot of good people have you know considered signing these contracts and. In the end, I don't, I don't want to judge anyone because when it comes down to if your options are selling your ranch or a portion of your ranch or farm, or signing on to a conservation easement, I'm not gonna, you know, say what the right decision would be there, and who knows what who knows what any of us would do. Um, but I do want to have all the information out there, and so that's why I wanted to have Margaret on and to talk about everything that these these easements entail. And also, I think the the goal for the USDA seems to be to push these easements and to get people to sign up for them. And that's the same with their Climate Smart um, um, commodity program and, and a lot of their issues. But I think the goal for what the goal, real goal for the U.S. Department of Agriculture should be is to get farmers and ranchers so that they don't have to come running to the USDA if they feel like they're forced to sell their land. Farmers and ranchers should be able to do their work and get paid well for their commodities and be able to operate their farms and ranchers without running to the USDA for help. But that's not the goal of the USDA. And so, and that's really, you know, what I'm doing with Lonesome Lands um, is to kind of push back on that. You know, there's not very many journalist type um, or, or media type people that are talking about what the real goal for agriculture should be is that agriculture should be a self-sustainable. You know, there's all this talk about sustainability, but we don't talk about how we actually should be able to do this without government intervention and government help. And we should be able to do it in the best way possible. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do with Lonesome Lands. And that's why I want to have Margaret on and a lot of these independent voices. And if you would like to support me and, and Lonesome Lands and what we're trying to do here, you can go to lonesomelands.com. Uh, Click on subscribe at the top of the page and you'll see a number of different options there of how to help. If you're on a phone, there's three black bars at the top of the page, which are menu. If you click on that and click on subscribe and you will see those subscription options there. And so here is Margaret Byfield. All right. Back with Margaret Byfield um, from American Stewards of Liberty and they, um, I guess I'll let you update. Last time we had you on was about national, uh, national asset companies. I always get that weird because I find that to be a weird name. Um, but, and then I wanted to have you on your first returning guest. I think we've done less than 10 podcasts and I'm having you on again, but we, I wanted to talk about conservation easements because they're, it seems like they're really getting pushed lately. Um, and so I guess we'd start off by updating the national asset company, what has happened with that? Um, if they're not familiar, the rule has been withdrawn. Is that what they did? Yeah, the New York Stock Exchange withdrew that rule. So that was a huge victory for the property rights movement. And you know, just to kind of remind your listeners what that was, that was an attempt by the New York Stock Exchange and a group called Intrinsic Exchange Group, which is funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and supported by a lot of the major environmental groups, basically all the people who are pushing the climate crisis agenda and the 30 by 30 agenda. So they have been moving agendas that are leading to 
the disruption of um, our country by um, by uh, through all these green policies of locking down uh, oil and gas, you know, locking up land through 30 by 30 and these different various agendas. And they all kind of came together through this vehicle that they were attempting to create was this natural asset company. And that would have allowed the world elites and even uh, foreign entities, uh, our enemies like China, to invest in our protected assets and then control those assets because the the rule, the SEC rule gave them the management authority over those. So things such as the ecosystem services that come off um, private lands could be enrolled in these. Uh, ecosystem services, including natural processes um, like um, pollination, photosynthesis, things that nobody has a right to own would be monetized and enrolled into these natural asset companies. And so, you know, we're going to talk about conservation easements today, but one of our big concerns is that the ecosystem services from conservation easements could be enrolled in these vehicles that the world elites would profit off of with or without the landowner's consent. And that was, you know, really a frightening piece of all this. Additionally, things like our, our national parks could be enrolled in them for uh, China to then control the resources uh, that way and just had so many frightening elements to it. Um, of course, the, the national security implications, the elimination, um, reduction of property rights from the landowners and, um, and, and then the attempt to monetize natural processes, which is something that really has not been attempted before because these natural processes are things that everybody depends on and needs to live. And they're really not something that you can control. You can't contain them. And so they've never been monetized before. Um, they've been valued. The financial markets consider them externalities that you take into account, which then influences the values of the actual consumer products that you can you know, create by sell. And, um, but this was a major step um, to try to monetize those meant that somebody was going to own those, the air you breathe and the air I breathe. Right. And that was a huge step. And so we were able to uh, get that stopped, did it in about three months. And it took some heroic efforts by some incredible people. Um, Representative Harriet Hagman from Wyoming is absolutely one of the heroes on this. And Senator uh, Rick, uh, sorry, sorry, Senator Pete Ricketts, Another one from Nebraska is another one who really led the charge. And uh, of course, Marla Oaks, the Utah state treasurer is the one who really galvanized the states against this. And then ultimately, uh, Bruce Westerman, chairman of the House Natural Resource Committee was one of the leaders on this too, as he initiated oversight into this rule. But it took uh, you know all these forces coming together and um, exposing it and challenging it and, and thankfully, this was pushed back. But this was a scary moment for the nation. It really was. Right. And most people don't even know it took place. <laughs> right, yeah. And then and that's what kind of led me into today um, and the conservation easements. And we'll get back into the NIC, NACs and how, I mean, that stop or that fight hasn't over. They've just kind of drawn back, I guess, for a little while. Um, but one thing, after the last podcast, I felt like... Um, we didn't get much into your background and kind of who you are and how you got into this deal. So um, do you want to go into that a little bit and, and how your background has kind of led you to where you are in, in, in this fight for property rights? Yeah, sure. So I was raised on a ranch in Nevada. So we had a big cow calf operation, a very typical federal lands ranch. Uh, we, we were a medium sized ranch in Nevada. We ran on 1100 square um, miles, 1100 square miles. And of course, that was our winter range and our summer range. Only 7,000 of that was private deeded lands. So basically, the federal government was our business partner in everything. But we owned all the water on those lands, which is typical uh, of the landowner in the West. You, you have your base property, you have the right to graze that range, and then you own the water in that range. And that's pretty typical. So we were, we were pretty typical federal lands ranch. 
but um, really from the moment that we purchased that ranch, which was in 1978, uh, we came under incredible regulatory pressures through by the US Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. And really to kind of sum it up, it was an effort to control the land by getting a hold of our water. So one of the first things that the Forest Service did was they filed a claim over all of our water rights on the national forest. And then, um, and then started regulating us. So using the regulations to cut cattle counts, say we were overgrazing, um, move our cattle into areas they weren't supposed to be inside us with trespass and a whole bunch of, of different things that they did over the course of the years. And um, so we fought them for 13 years and fought against all of those. We went through three administrative appeals processes. And finally in 1991, my parents decided, I mean, we were out of business. There wasn't anywhere that we could uh, put a cow that it wouldn't be violating some rule or regulation. And so we were out of business. So mom and dad decided instead of going through the uh, administrative appeals route again, that we would actually make a property rights case. So we filed the first federal lands grazing takings case ever filed in America in the US Court of Federal Claims. And from there, we actually, we won every round. Um, we won $14.4 million from the federal government for the taking of our property, both physical and regulatory. Um, and then, however, we did lose one round, which was the last one. <laughs> and that was at the US District Court, uh, DC Circuit. Uh, the case got before three uh, Eastern judges who had no concept of federal lands issues, which are pretty complex and, um, and really just punted. And so they decided against us based on two technicalities, said that we didn't have standing and we didn't have ripeness on some specific issues. So that eliminated the case. The Supreme Court denied hearing it. And um, at the end of the day, uh, we've, we were in court 27 years um, but we were never compensated for the taking of our property. We lost the case and we ultimately lost the ranch. And here you are, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's given you the, the, I guess, motivation to, to fight for other people's um, property rights. Yeah. Yeah. And so the reason I called you and called you back so quick, I guess, um, is because I heard a podcast promoted by National Cattlemen's Beef Association where they had two kind of what I felt like were salesmen for conservation easements um, on there. And they were kind of promoting these ideas of, of ranchers getting involved and, and signing up for conservation easements to protect their land um, for future generations. And the first place I heard about conservation easements was from you and um, in your your push back on the 30 by 30 plan. Um, and so I reached out to you and thought we needed to kind of put some or just kind of just go through over like I don't want this to be all about their what they were talking about, but just go over conservation easements and make sure maybe there's an alternative view out there. And pe so people really know like the kind of the the, you know, they talked a lot about the you know, the benefits, but, um, you know, talk about the, the downside of, of what you're actually signing on to. And so, um, can you just kind of explain what a conservation easement is? Yeah. So a conservation easement is, well, it's a device that the environmentalists created years ago. And one of the first documents that we read on it, um, the, the discussion for creating these was that they knew that in order to control private property, they would never have enough money to actually go out and buy it. Therefore, one of the things they came up with was this conservation easement. It would give them the ability to control property, but they wouldn't have to actually purchase the entire property, but they still have the same functional control. So that was the, the genesis of a conservation easement. Another key thing they did was they named it conservation easement when actually as the device in law that it actually fits is something called a conservation servitude. The reason is because once that conservation easement is placed on the land, the landowner becomes the Serbian estate. They're no longer the pri primary um, entity controlling that land. So it's known as a conservation servitude. Again, they knew if they called them conservation servitudes, many landowners would immediately back away because they would understand what that meant. But calling it a conservation easement, it kind of puts in, I think, landowners' minds, oh, this is like a road easement or it's, you know, something nice and useful. And, um, you know, we're familiar with road easements. That doesn't control the entire property, but a conservation easement does. 
So it's different. It should never have been named that, but that was, that was a deliberate decision they made in order to get more of these put in place. So what the conservation easement does is you are selling the development rights to a land trust or the government. And so, um, and then this is, uh, this is authorized under the IRS tax code. So ultimately, what you have to understand about a conservation easement is ultimately, it doesn't matter who's holding that easement, the IRS is the enforcer of that easement. So it's that tax code that requires that for you to get the tax deduction, the tax benefit, either through income tax or through an estate tax, which applies to the first generation that holds the easement, um, then there's certain things that the, that the easement has to do. It has to, it cannot have any mining on it. Uh, the conservation purpose must be for a legitimate conservation purpose, meaning things like protecting species. And, and we heard on the podcast, um, he talked about the one easement in California that was protecting the salamander and save the ranch. So there's always a conservation purpose with these. Uh, that conservation purpose controls the property, every bit of that property. So it, it doesn't really, you have a contract, the landowner signs a contract that where, which is basically the baseline. They write in everything you're doing on that land today. And, um, and that you can continue doing. You have to write everything in there that you want. But then you also heard them talk about the building envelopes. They also in that contract have to write out if they ever wanna build another house on that property uh, in the future. And remember the conservation easement is signed in perpetuity. That's a requirement of the IRS tax code. So they're not making the decision for how many houses they want to build on that property. Like if they have a couple of kids and may wanna come back and you know build a house next to them. Um, they're making that decision for every generation going forward. So think 200, 300, 500, 1,000 years from now, they're making that decision on that piece of land, whether or not those people can build another house. So that's, you know, that's a part I think that people don't really understand. No, you know, if you're in agriculture, you know that you're doing really well to predict what's going to happen this year. You know, I mean, really, right. it's a volatile um, industry. That's the nature of it. And so to, to sign these kind of contracts and limit your ability and future generations ability on what you can do on the land um, is very troubling. Uh, is certainly something that I think people need to think twice about. But another key component of this is the easement itself is you have to understand there's a number of restrictions placed on that land, but they only apply to the landowner. Right. So the landowner is the one who's agreeing to all these restrictions. The, con the land trust is given the ability to manage, oversee the land, enforce, and actually the federal government to enforce uh, that this conservation purpose is carried out on the land, whatever that is. Yeah, and that's, yeah, looking through kind of your information, one thing that people like what you're going off of what you're saying, what I got out of your information was the top priority is conservation. So if you have a ranch, your top priority is, you know, stewarding the land, making sure it's viable to, to make a living off of or for yourself and future generations. When you sign that conservation easement, the top priority, no matter what is conserving the land. And if that means, you know, whatever, and they can change them. Is that right? Like the, the land trust holder can change the requirements. You said the, the, all the restrictions are on the landowner. There are, so there aren't any restrictions on the easement holder. Um, can they be changed? Well, the easement holder, I mean, they are restricted. There's, you know, they can't go on the property anytime they want, you know, there's, there's different things that are written into that. And from that sense, but the con you have to understand that the conservation purpose now controls the use of that land. So if there's going to be a conflict between the landowner's use of the land and whether or not that's harming a species that is, is the purpose right. written for the conservation purpose, then it's going to be the landowner's activities that give way. Now, um, but so there, the, the, it depends on how the contract is written. I, the, if the conservation purpose is written very tightly, um, then it's going to be harder for them to change that necessarily. 
but you know, the ones that I've seen, the conservation purpose is a couple of paragraphs and it's very loosely written. Mm -hmm. Like um, I saw one for, to conserve the American burying beetle. And in it said, it said the conservation purpose would comply with the U S fish and wildlife services requirements for the American burying beetle. Well, now that means that conservation purpose is going to change as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service changes their requirements, which could either be extremely restrictive or light. Um, so that's where that's where it gets troubling, where you don't really know uh, how that's going to play out in the future. And you know, you get to things like like on the NAC rule, where they said everything had to be managed for sustainability, and then they don't define sustainability. The 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 conservation purposes can be written that way where it's really not very clear, mm -hmm. um, you know, what all that could mean in the future. One of the things that can be written in as part of that conservation purpose is agriculture. So agriculture use can be a conservation purpose. However, it still has to comply with the IRS regulations. And the, the other thing is you're giving the authority to enforce that to a land trust or the federal government. And so you, you get back to the, the whole thing of who wants to be controlling your land, you or somebody else. And, um, and the conservation purpose or the conservation easement changes that. Yeah. Okay. And that's when you were talking about the, the thousands of years, like this perpetuity is forever. And one of the things I think in your information that, that kind of, it kind of visualize it is controlled by the dead hand something something that was written in there about the dead hand and it's like and it's yeah i mean that can be you know i'm sixth generation or fifth generation farming in this part of the country um and you imagine like what those guys you know i mean my ancestor they were farming with horses and i mean you just think of the changes and how they have absolutely no idea of of what we need or how we need to operate and and that's what you're doing to your to your future generations. Um, and you talked about the differences in who holds them, and that's kind of this this podcast that we talked about. Um, and I guess we could mention the two organizations. Um, you, I, I forget what they were, but you had them that the, the people were representing on that podcast were Texas um, Texas I Rangeland to Trust. Trust. But California Rangeland Trust and then California. Texas Agricultural Land, Land Trust. Okay. And yeah. and those guys, they kind of made it sound like, well, they were the good ones. Um, and you said there are a lot of differences. Are there any good ones um, in your eyes? Well, you know, I was really curious in listening to that because um, and, and how they explained it. And if you listened very closely to what they said, um, they like one of the things they talked about is, yes, they do take federal funding in order to either purchase the conservation easement or help get that in place um, for the landowner to make it easy on the landowner to do this. But they say, they kept saying, however, we hold the easement. So you're not dealing with the federal government, so you don't have to worry about that. Well, you know, the, the conservation easements that I've read that where the government has funded a portion of those or even some of those like the agriculture conservation easement which is uh, implemented through the NR nrcs which is one of the ones that they mentioned i mean i've read those contracts and they the federal government retains the right of enforcing that contract that's in the contract that the landowner has to sign so you know they may be holding it and that, that may be a really good partnership between the landowner and that land trust. But at the end of the day, um, if the federal government doesn't think that land trust is enforcing that conservation purpose to the level that it believes the contract requires, they can enforce it. And that's that's something the landowner is signing on. So there's there's really no way to get away from those federal strings if the federal money is involved in those contracts. And also in your information, I read that... Um they can be sold correct yeah. um mm -hmm. so no matter who like so these both of those gentlemen that represent um like california rangeland trust they could sell the easement to um i guess in your in your example nature conservancy is the main um i guess probably the biggest um easement mm -hmm. purchaser um and they had a easement where they they purchased um 
from a property owner for 1.2 million. And then they sold it. I wrote it down somewhere. They sold it for 1.4 million um, to the federal. The Bureau of Land Management. Yeah, BLM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they yeah. made they made money and then the BLM holds the easement. Um, and that is that part of the contract? Like, is that for all of them? Like th these guys who are selling these easements to ranchers, could they sell them? Well, so a good contract is actually, so they've learned. Um, the, the early contracts were written uh, without even considering that they could be controlled, could be sold. And so you had a lot of those things happen where, you know, the, um, the landowner would say, I'm not, I don't want to sell, I don't want an easement held by the federal government. So, you know, Nature Conservancy has knocked on my door. They said they can bail me out and help me here. So I'm going to sign with them. And then they find out, you know, that that easement has been sold. So that was happening a lot in the kind of the, the first conservation easements that were going on. Um, the, I, would, I would suspect that a group like Texas Agriculture Land Trust and the California Rains Land Trust, I would suspect they have a clause in there where they will not transfer that easement. Mainly because, I mean, that's just one of those things, the problems with easements that people have realized. And so as long as it's written in the contract that they can't transfer it, then um, the landowner doesn't need to be concerned about that part. But again, you know, you've got to have a really good attorney who really knows conservation easements and knows all the pitfalls to protect you from things like that. Um, but that was a real problem, you know, early on, and it probably still is today with those who are signing these um, with entities that, you know, obviously are not looking out after their best interest. But um, that also raised another concern for us when we, when we get back to the natural asset companies, because we know that these can be transferred. We know that they can be utilized in different ways. The easements, you have, the, the easement is a property right owned by the land trust. So if you go to the Nature Conservancy's balance sheet, you will see a line item that has the total amount that they owe that they own in billions in conservation easements worldwide. It's a value, they own it, it's their property right. So um, unless you thought when you signed that conservation easement to write into your contract, just like the clause that you can't transfer these, um, you need to write in, these cannot be used for an investment product or for any kind of an investment purchase or, you know, you retain the right of all ecosystem services, which is a term that most landowners are just now starting to get familiar with, and they still don't really understand what it is. That would have had to been written in, um, in to prevent the land trusts from actually enrolling these in these natural asset companies. That's why in the beginning, when I said they could enroll them with or without the landowner's consent, only those contracts that had the foresight to say, the conservation easement cannot be used in any kind of investment product are the ones who would have been protected from doing this. And I would guess that that's going to be very, very few. I will tell you the entities that do, did know to do this are the environmental groups. So I recently read one that is held by the conservation fund and they retain their ecosystem services. They've been in, in the know on this mm -hmm. for some time. So they, as they've been signing conservation easements, they've been making sure they hold that value so they can enroll it on their land into these natural asset companies. So, but most landowners have not been in the know on that. And so they're very vulnerable. Again, you know, it, it gets to the whole question of, should you be signing a contract that you have to predict every big and small variable that can happen in the future that may impact your operation? and future generations operations to protect that land. You just simply can't do it. Um, and that's, that's the real vulnerability of a conservation easement and why, you know, we, we tell them or just, if you're getting into this because um, you have financial concerns, there's other ways, there's other devices and probably better ways to handle that. And then, you know, Chad Sullivan, uh, he was the one, I, I, you probably know him as well, but he's the one who said, nobody has to pay me to take care of my land. Right. If I don't want it developed, nobody has to pay me to do that. I will make sure it is not developed. And, and that's really, you know, that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And so I guess, what was your opinion on the podcast? 
or and, and just those two organizations and the way those guys were i mean to me it just seemed like they were salesmen and they were selling um you know their product and and it almost seemed like the host was a little he he actually said at one point i'm i'm not a, he said i'm in the middle i'm not opposed and i'm not supportive um and it kind of made me think and he's from Montana and from a ranching area, it sounded like. So um, it made me think he has heard some of the horror stories um, to say that I'm not supportive. But I was just curious, like your overall opinion of that, of the just the program. Um, well, yeah, you have to remember that, um, you know, the, the land trusts are not real estate agents. So even though they're doing a land transaction, uh, they don't have to give full disclosure. So, you know, they are just really given the good side. I think the one good piece of advice they gave was really think about this. Really, you know, that was a very good piece of advice, but they certainly didn't offer up any of the real downsides to a conservation easement. And so it was a one-sided, you know, one-sided discussion, I think, but they also, the purpose of their organizations are to enroll lands in conservation easements. So that is their job. Um, I, and so that, of course, is what they were promoting. You know, um, one of the things I find really interesting, and I learned this from a landowner in Colorado, but um, she just, uh, she, there was uh, a job fair going on at the local junior co college, and they were bringing in the Nature Conservancy to come in and talk to the students about, you know, what you need to do to get involved in conservation and get involved with a group like Nature Conservancy, what kind of background you had to have. And so she decided to sit in on this. And, um, and she's there, they were, weren't really talking about their backgrounds, such as, you know, what their profet what they studied in school or anything. So she started asking questions. She asked the executive director, you know, what, what did you study in school? And he said, well, I have a law degree. And then she asked the range conservationists, what did you study, study in school? Well, I have a law degree. And to a T in that particular office, every employee of the Nature Conservancy had a law degree. And, and that, that tells you that it's more about uh, the land transaction than the conservation of the land. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I, after hearing that, I started paying attention a little bit more to the backgrounds of, of these individuals who are really promoting conservation easements. And, you know, I noticed that uh, the two gentlemen on that podcast both had a, a background that comes out of government. And so and they're going to the be same thing, right? When they, yeah, when they said yeah. that, I was like, okay, we got one. I think one was USDA and the other one was NRCS. So, yeah. And so they're predisposed mm -hmm. to to be okay with a little bit of control, government control mm -hmm. over property. And of course, you know, that's where, uh, you know, I immediately start pushing back because I have lived in that situation where uh, government has too much control, government or another entity, even, you know, an, an environmental NGO, uh, the land trust holding these. And, you know, there just is no replacement for having full control of your property. And when government owns a portion of that or has any kind of a piece of that, including just enforceability behind a conservation easement held by a friendly land trust, um, you know, it just spells trouble in the future. And uh, it's just a, it's just a level of control that I think we ought to all really push back on. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's kind of how I felt about it. And I'm I've always hard on National Cattlemen's Beef Association, but I think this it, it, it kind of gave a good example of um, to me, you know, guys they put on their cowboy hats, they go down to the convention, they have agriculture backgrounds, and they know people, and so they they seem like you know somebody you can talk to and somebody you can trust, but but they're still selling something that's that's actually taking your rights away. Um, and that's how I, how I look at it. They, they, you know, and that goes into NCBA and how they try to come off as this grassroots organization, but in the end, they're, they're, they're off their main office is in Washington, DC, and that's where they do all their work. So, um, and to get into, you said they didn't mention any of the downside, and I guess you can go over some of the downsides, but the scariest one to me that I've heard, and even recently, um, is the property value. Um, and, and these guys talk about how it saves the ranch and, and this is the only way we could do it to save our property. Some of their, some of their account or people they've worked with, um, 
but in the end, um, can you talk about, I guess, just go on, talk about some of the downsides and, and what it actually does to property values. Yeah. So um, across the board, I think the the number I've heard most consistently is that it devalues the property by 40%. The Department of Revenue in Nebraska did a study on this and found that the, the Federal Wetlands Reserve um, Conservation Program or easement that they put in devalues has devalued the land 40% across the board in Nebraska. Uh, in the Texas Hill Country, I talked to a realtor just a couple of weeks ago who was listing a piece of property that had a conservation easement on it. And uh, the buyer's appraisal came in extremely low. In fact, he wouldn't even say what it was. And so they went out and they got a new appraisal and they were able to get the value to where it was only reduced by 40%. So again, 40%, you know, I think, and on the podcast, they said somewhere between, you know, about 30%. And then they said, you know, 40 to 30%. I, I think it's really more like 40%. Uh, it's probably a pretty good number. So then, then what happens, then you have to look at um, what that does to the community. So if you have a lot of lands that are in conservation in a county, um, and I'm saying and not only just conservation easements, but all the conservation programs that also can be um, that also can be um, put into place um, that eliminate or reduce production, like um, CRPP lands. When you have a lot of this in a community, it is a huge stressor on the local economy because it, it reduces the taxes, the property value, the property taxes for that revenue, and it reduces production. So we know there's a huge turnover rate of agriculture. You know, when you grow a crop, um, that farmer's buying his fuel there, um, he's employing people, there's the turnover rate of that dollar in that local community is far beyond any, any other real industry. And so, when you reduce the production, you also really hurt the local economy. And so it puts stress on, stress on the local economy to where your counties can't um, pay for the schools, the hospitals, emergency services, all of those needs. Then that puts the county in a position where they need state and federal funds to operate. So ultimately what these conservation programs are doing is creating a dependency class. They are making landowners dependents of the federal government, which is the exact opposite of the landowners who founded our country. Uh, they were super independent and did not want anything from the government and were self-sufficient and lived their lives accordingly. That breed of landowner is really, we're, we're losing them today. Um, as the federal conservation programs come in, like conservation easements, reduce the values, which puts more pressure on the landowner to stay in business because it's the federal government that's outpricing um, and directly competing with these, the, the working landowner who doesn't wanna have any ties to the federal government. It makes it harder for them to compete and to stay out of the conservation program. So it's the cycle. You know, they're really forcing uh, landowners into these programs by making it the only economic option to move forward with. So, um, you know, we're still at a place in this country where we can push back on all that. We don't have to accept that. And, um, and I really encourage people to really think, think deeply about not just what that, that conservation easement does for you in the short term, but what it does for the country in the long term. And uh, every time you erode property rights, you are eroding liberty. And conservation easements are a device that that as we heard on the NCBA podcast, um, they talked about how the landowner still owns that land and you still pay the taxes. Sure, they have possessory interest in it, but they no longer have functional control of the property. And that's why when you put a conservation easement on your property, it's no longer private property because you have sold control of that property to a federal government or a land trust. Yeah, that's one thing that kind of jumped into my mind because one of the guys talked about how once you sign the easement you know it's we're going to keep a relationship with you and i'll keep checking back in and things like that and i thought well yeah you have to go back and make sure that these people aren't 
you know, building fences or doing other things to improve this property because they've signed an easement to, to make sure that, you know, that says that they won't. So it has to be checked up on. And he kind of said that he goes in and of course he wants to check on them. And he talked about how he's looking for um, adding income streams like carbon markets and things and ecosystem. And I thought, Oh, good grief. This guy's just going around selling federal, you know, selling federal programs. Um, and that kind of leads me into what's the, I, I kind of, I've been thinking about the NACs and the, and the conservation easement and how they kind of have come up lately. What's the main government, I guess, department that pushes them? Is it the Department of Natural Resources? Is that where they come from? Yeah, Department of Agriculture. So the Farm Bill uh, um, funds, has several different funding programs. They fund the wetlands conservation easement program. They fund the agriculture conservation easement program. USDA also, which oversees U.S. Forest Service, and they have the Forest Legacy Fund conservation easement program. There are a ton of these conservation easement programs out there. There's also something called the Regional um, Conservation Partnership Program. That's also funded through the NRCS, um, USDA NRCS. All of these are funded through the Farm Bill. So, you know, we're, we're seeing the farm, we're, we'll have a new Farm Bill that's supposed to come out in May. We'll see what it looks like and how many of these conservation dollars are in there. But the Regional Conservation Program is a stream of funding that goes directly to environmental organizations to do things like encourage landowners to sign up for conservation easements. And so there's, and in fact, um, recently USDA just announced, in fact, the last couple of weeks that they, for 2024, they will be spending $1.5 billion giving to these environmental NGOs to go out and do things like put conservation easements and other conservation programs on private property. And so, and, and in that, they say that they will be reaching 180,000 farms, 225 million acres is what they are targeting with this. Now, if you want to get back to, four, to 30 by 30, to, you know, they, they say they have 12% permanently protected and they're trying to get another 18%, which is roughly 400 million acres in America. Well, this one program alone, giving money to the environmental groups to put pressure on the landowners is half of that, 225 million acres. So um, this is one of the things that I think we have, we have got to turn off the spigot. Our country doesn't have the money to be throwing at these kind of things. And, and when I hear people say, well, the, you know, that's my tax dollars, they're using my tax dollars. I push back on that and say, they're not using your tax dollars, they're using China dollars because these are all debt dollars. We have long surpassed our tax dollars. We're right. now just everything we're funding is funded by debt dollars. And so um, those are the kind of things that I think, along with the conservation easements, um, they, they re we really need to think hard about, should we be spending all this money on these programs? We create an independent class of landowners and we are all losing our independence as a result of that. And, um, and we don't have the money to spend on it. And so, yeah. yeah. And I am, if you've listened to this at all, I haven't had that many episodes, but you might notice that I am a pretty skeptical person. And so when I see things happen, like the NAC rule get just dropped and never voted on, then I, and then you see this push for conservation easements, I'm kind of thinking, well, you know, and you said USDA and NRCS want more and more people to sign up for conservation easements. Well, if this NAC rule is out there, that will prevent, and the truth comes out from people like you who are talking about how once you sign these easements, then the actual, they can be monetized for these big corporations um, and, and just become a moneymaker and, and you lose even more control. Um, and so the NAC thing to me looked like something that would stop people from signing conservation easements. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. And so yeah. to drop that rule and to push for more conservation easements, like, do you think that that was kind of a motivation um, to drop the rule and, and get more people signed up? And then later on, once, once they have their 400 million acres, um, 
<laughs> in conservation easements bring the rule back to where it's actually even more valuable for people or there's more value to take, I guess, uh, off the land. What do you think about that? I, I think it was the New York Stock Exchange that realized they were in, they, they got sold a bill of goods in this. They thought it was going to be a money maker. I don't think they expected the pushback. Um, I don't, I don't know that they fully vetted what this was going to do. Um, they, I, they're the ones who pulled the withdrew the rule. And um, I know a little bit of the inside ball of how that all happened. And so uh, I'm, I think it's going to be very hard for the New York Stock Exchange to actually step in and partner with IEG again on this. Mm-hmm. I think IEG is going to have to find a different, a different place to create this market vehicle. Um, I could be wrong about that. And we certainly shouldn't let up the pressure. But um, Intrinsic Exchange Group, however, has not stopped at all in trying to promote this. And you're exactly right. Um, I, the articles, we've been following what they're doing, and they talk about how this was all misunderstood, and this is really to help landowners. So I'm expecting this to come back, the new natural asset company, probably a new name, um, to come back in a form that looks like a very friendly landowner. And so that they 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 get over that hurdle, which is, you know, the one that you were just talking about when people really you know, realize the Band-Aid was ripped off and you could see, oh my gosh, this is what, this is how they're going to control our assets, our real assets. Um, so I think they've got to dress it up and we've seen them. I mean, I think right now they're spending a ton of money on PR because they got a really good piece placed in the um, New York Times, you know, promoting these. Uh, IEG has been, a lot of the agriculture publications, the big farming publications have been doing friendly articles on these and the, the importance of ecosystem services. And so um, just, just watching all of this and then also IEG scrubbed their website. So they had, you know, a lot of stuff on there about how bad agriculture is. Agriculture being the worst defender of emissions and even, even had a piece on there saying that um, in, increase in ecosystem services, basically the non-production of the land, is even more important than pr- than food production. So they scrubbed that phrase from their website as well. And so they're really having to rebrand themselves to being landowner friendly is what I think they're going through right now to come back and sell it. So we will, we will, we will see this come again, and we will have a lot of work to do to get landowners to understand. Don't drink the Kool Aid. <laughs> This is just a new color lipstick. Right. And to go back into kind of the guys that were selling it on that, on that podcast, um, you talked about the 1.5 billion and for, for landowners, I think it's important to, um, to remember that like, why do, why would the government want this so badly to spend Mm 1.5 billion? You know, it's not to help you. It's to get control of you. Like that's what the government wants. Like we are living in this new era where the number one you know priority once your eyes have been open i think what covid actually really did was open a lot of people's eyes so that the number one priority of the federal government is to control the population right now um yeah. and so now right they're pushing out this 1.5 billion dollars to control agriculture land is really that's the end goal with these conservation easements um to go back to the podcast like are those those organizations um that the, that those guys represented in Texas and California are they getting some of that money like is there a, is that why they're on this podcast is that why there's a new push because they have all this new money to to go out and sign these contracts well i know the Texas Agriculture Land Trust uh, accepted some got a grant from an entity called the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that is a C3 that's a nonprofit that was created by congress and, you know, right after 30 by 30 was launched, one of the first things that the, or, you know, within the first year that the, that the Department of Interior did was commit to fund, to, to generate funding up to a billion dollars that would go to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to implement 30 by 30. So you have the Department of Interior basically offloading its funding to this nonprofit so that basically Congress can't pull that funding back, can't rescind that. Um, At the same time, you have Jeff Bezos' group 
uh, Earth Fund, I think it's his group, I forget what his fund is called, who he is worldwide pushing the 30 by 30 agenda. And so he's also making huge contributions to National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to implement 30 by 30. Now, Texas Agriculture Land Trust recently publicized that they just got this great grant from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to put in conservation easements in the Texas area. So um, that's another way that those funds are streamed through. You know, from the podcast, they said that they take uh, federal yeah. grants for some of these programs. So I'm assuming it's probably the Agriculture Conservation Easement Program is what they, they use as well. They also said part of their funding comes from private donations and, and philanthropic work. So, I mean, there you go. You just list it. I mean, Jeff Bezos wants more people signed up and, you know, he's working towards it. So when they say philanthropic work on, on you know, a kind of ranching type podcast, you probably think of some old rancher who likes what they're doing, you know. And the one guy said the Ca California Cattlemen started um, – the Cal California one. Um, and so you think about those things, but you don't know whose money that is and, and what their objectives are. Yeah. And so um, to kind of round it off, um, one of the guys and and this kind of, I think this probably was good for a lot of people, but like I said, I'm very skeptical. So at the end of the podcast, he gave this you know, kind of heartwarming story of of how he got one rancher to sign up for this conservation easement and it was the the rancher told him it was the first good night of sleep he's ever had he's had in however many years is finally he could sleep at night knowing what would happen to the ranch in the future um and to me i think you know that kind of works on a lot of people but to me it kind of gave me a, a sales very salesman -y type vibe where this guy is is pushing hard to get people to sign up um where the, where they i think they worked hard not to be salesman -y, but but like that, that story to me was like, okay, like you're just, you just want people to call you up and get signed up on this deal. And so I was wondering if you had a story, um, I know you have plenty of horror stories of people who've signed these things and then they come to you for help or, or information. Um, do you have anything kind of like that? You know, I think one, one story that still um, is very troubling to me is there was a group of landowners in Colorado. They were all farmers and all of them were stressed financially, having a hard time making it. And they were sold the idea of going into a conservation easement. So they all signed up for these easements, a large group of landowners. And when you sign up for the easement, first you have to sign the contract with the land trust. So you make that commitment to the land trust. Then the IRS takes a look at it to see if it meets all the requirements of the IRS tax code, so you get the tax deduction. And so um, they, they made it through all of that. The IRS gave them the tax deduction. So they got the tax deduction for the first year, and I think the second year. And the third year, the IRS came back and decided that the appraisal used to value all those properties, which was by a state appraiser, was uh, wrong, was incorrect. And so um, they... Rene they rescinded uh, the conservation easement, they rescinded the tax deduction, and then they have charged back taxes and penalties on those landowners because it was a fraudulent appraisal. Now, I think I, I still, you know, get um, articles on this, but every year the there's, you know, there's people in the Colorado legislature that are trying, you know, try to get a bill passed to you know, help give some kind of subsistence to these landowners who are in this situation. Because the landowners then, um, they went back to the land trust and said, okay, well this, you know, we were promised we were gonna get this, you know, this um, conservation easement, this tax protection, we used your appraiser and uh, now it's been reneged. So we want you to null and void the contract so we can now put in higher yielding crops and change our operations so that we can actually increase our income so that we can pay these penalties and taxes. And the land trust said, sorry, contract's a done deal. It's in perpetuity. <laughs> and so, you know, that's, um, again, in, I'm sure they got involved with it thinking it was a landowner friendly land trust. But at the end of the day, you know, that land trust has that conservation easement. They have that value. 
uh, they're not going to give that up. And the la some landowners have, you know, obviously had to sell out. Um, and I've heard of a lot of people, you know, I hear stories all the time of the second generation that, you know, their, their, their parents enrolled it in a conservation easement for financial reasons to keep in operation. And if you do it for that reason, then putting the conservation easement on and further restricting what you can do with that land is not, it, at some point it's going to hurt you and come back to bite you. And second generation, you know, they, they got to where, um, they couldn't hold on to the property anymore because they even could do less with it. And um, they actually had to just let it go into foreclosure and just, you know, give it up. And that was a landowner in Utah. And when she told me that story, she was crying on the phone. So um, there's so many downsides to this. And we do have a publication that we put out, very simple guide. It's, you know, conservation easements or servitude, uh, 13 questions lent, or 13 things landowners should know about conservation easements. And it basically outlines those other things you ought to consider before you sign a conservation easement. Ours is weighted towards the bad parts of conservation easements because we don't need to promote conservation easements. They do a good job on their own. We just wanted to have a vehicle that, that would give landowners that ability to ask those questions of how things can go wrong to make sure they're fully informed. Yeah, and when, yeah, when you're signing something in perpetuity, you want to kind of focus on the bad parts like that's yeah. forever yeah and then you were yeah. telling that story and i thought about you know well that rancher who had his one good night's sleep um you know three years down the road he could have been billed all of his back taxes for the last three years you yeah. know i mean that's this that's yeah. what comes to mind and that's what i thought about because i've heard all the negative things about you know now he's had his one good night's sleep but how's he going to sleep you know years down the road when he realizes yeah. kind of what he's done to his to his descendants <laughs> and, and what the, what'll happen to the place. Um, I mean, and like going back, like you were talking about that, like you think about all the changes the land goes through in, you know, the 140 years that we've been here, um, you know, and it's hard to imagine, you know, yeah. my Can't great, great grandfather, you know, putting restrictions on us of what we could do here and, and what we could and couldn't do here. Um, and so, I feel like we've, we've pretty well covered it and, and I actually did keep track of time, but if you want to just give where we can find you and I'll have that, I'll have the link to that guide, that conservation easement guide in the description and, and American stewards of Liberty and all that stuff. But um, yeah, if you want to give a, where, where can we find you, I guess. Sure. So American stewards us. That's the website. And that's where we put up most of these things and that guides up there and that's all free and downloadable. So, um, and you can, you know, we do articles on conservation easements all the time. So you can even just in the search engine, just put in conservation easements and you'll see a number of articles come up that'll, you know, hit different parts and pieces of these. So, right. And anyway. you keep that, it, it's good to check back in because I, like I said, I met you at 30 by 30 in, um, was that two years ago? Yeah. I yeah. Think it we had a, there was a conference in Lincoln and then you just sent me this morning, the, 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 and I went back through it, your your kind of guidebook to conservation easements, and it's been updated a lot since then. Like there was a lot of different things. And I mean, just here in the last year with the NACs, that's in there. And so it's yeah. good to check back. And and if you have questions that come up as, as time goes on, I suppose you'll keep updating that. So thanks a lot for coming on um, both times now. <laughs> and <laughs> My I guess pleasure. We'll see, we'll see what happens in the future. I suppose it, we'll eventually have you on again. Um, Hopefully, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I know you'll keep fighting and I know they're going to keep pushing this stuff. So yeah. yeah, we'll definitely probably be seeing you again. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Jim. All right. So thanks again to Margaret and thanks to everybody for listening. Um, as I went back through that and, and edited it and listened to it again, what, what kept coming back into my mind was um, the old saying of how when you sit down the ne negotiation table, and your first thing you should do is look for the sucker. And if you don't see them, then you're it. Um, and so when you think about signing a contract in perpetuity forever and, and all the restrictions are on you and your property value is you're going to lose 40 percent or around 40 percent of your property value when you sign on to that contract. You know, you've got to remember who is the sucker in that deal. Um, 
and again, I don't want to sound like, um, I don't think Margaret's a judgmental person at all. And I don't, I hope I'm, I'm not sounding like a judgmental person because I know there's good people who have signed on to these easements. And I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do, but I want people to understand that this should be kind of one of the last options, you know, and, and hopefully it's, you know, the, it, when you're pushed down to those, those last options, this, this, if they see it as the lesser of two evils, um, I guess that's the path that they take. But um, thanks again to everybody for listening. Um, please like, subscribe, rate, review, do all those things, um, and share the video. That's the main thing I need is is more views. And, and it's been great to see how many views we've gotten um, and, and, and to watch this thing continue to grow. If you want to support what we're doing here, lonesomelands.com. Click subscribe at the top of the page. If you're on your phone, click the three bars at the top, which is a menu, and then click subscribe on there, and you'll see different uh, different options of how to support us. Thanks again. We'll see you soon.